Martin Luther, the Catholic priest, kindled a firestorm when he told people there was a higher authority than the Pope. They wanted to burn him at the stake, so dangerous were his teachings. But his ideas were too powerful to suppress, and the church was forced to retreat. The result was a tsunami of freedom and prosperity. This battle for personal freedom still continues. Who talks for God today? Find out on The Carter Report. Welcome back. We're talking about who speaks for God. Is it the Pope? Is it the pastor? Is it the church? Is it the hierarchy? Now, here's a little booklet that I've written, and it's crammed full of important information. A Christian's Authority. It talks about the Dark Ages, and it talks about what is happening today in the Christian church and in the world talks about kingly power. When the hierarchy says, you've got to do it because we tell you and we speak for God. If you want this little booklet with a big message, write to me at the address on the screen. I want to read you a, a statement out of the famous magazine called The Review and Herald. We publish in that magazine uh, two pages every month, but here's a statement from... 1861 by J.N. Loughborough. He said this, The first step of apostasy, hear that apostasy, you're lost if you go into apostasy. The first step of apostasy is to get up a creed, telling us what we shall believe. We tell you this, you see. The second is to make that creed a test of fellowship. The third is to try members by that creed. The fourth is to denounce as heretics those who do do not believe that creed. And fifth, to commence persecution against such. But we believe this, no creed but the Bible. Uh, And we agree with uh, the courageous Loughborough when we say no creed but the infallible word of God, the Holy Bible. And that controversial, because she was in her own day, and prolific author of the 19th and 20th century, Ellen White said this, the words of the Bible and the Bible alone should be heard from the pulpit. Pretty plain, isn't it? Why don't people do this? Why do we say, oh, we're going to do this, but we're not going to do this? Now, there's a strong reason why we do not believe in creeds. Because truth is progressive. Come in the Bible to Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 18 and 19. Proverbs chapter 4, 18 and 19. But the path of the just is as the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. The Bible says truth is like the sun. And when the sun gets up in the morning, he starts it just a little way, just a little bit of light. But as the sun gets stronger and stronger, the rays shine around the world. And the Bible says that's how it is with the truth. God gives us a little bit, all that that we can have the capacity to understand. But the truth becomes clearer and clearer. Truth is progressive. Now, you know how the pilgrims came across to this great land. The pilgrims were uh, Puritans. They had broken away from the Church of England because the Church of England wasn't following the truth of the Bible. The Church of England had broken away from the Church of Rome, but then the Church of England had settled down. They came from England via Holland. And I'm going to quote Great Controversy, page 291, 292, and I'm going to quote their pastor, who preached to them before they left. His name was John Robinson. Brethren, we are now ere long to part asunder. And the Lord knoweth whether I shall live ever to see your faces more. But whether the Lord hath appointed it or not, I charge you before God and his blessed angels 
to follow me no farther than I have followed Christ. If God should reveal anything to you by any other instrument of his, be as ready to receive it as ever you were to receive any truth from my ministry. For I'm very confident the Lord hath more truth and light yet to break forth out of his holy word. So, my friend, if truth is progressive, we cannot have creeds. Then he went on to say, for my part, I cannot sufficiently bewail the condition of the Reformed churches who are come to a period in religion and will go at present no farther than the instrument of their reformation. The Lutherans cannot be drawn to go beyond what Luther saw. And the Calvinists, you see, stick fast where they were left by that great man of God who yet saw not all things. This is a misery much to be lamented, for though they were burning and shining lights in their time, yet they penetrated not into the whole counsel of God, but were they now living, would be as willing to embrace further light as that which they first received. And that's what he said to the Puritans, Pilgrim Fathers, that God raised up the Lutherans, God raised up the Calvinists. But after the deaths of Luther and Calvin, their followers, you know what they did? They drew up creeds and would not advance. And so it has been with the Protestant churches that follow them. We believe what the founding fathers believed and we will go no farther. We have a creed. But we must continue to walk in the light because truth is progressive. First John chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You can only be cleansed from your sins if you walk in the light. And that's why we don't have a creed. Therefore, our only creed is the Holy Bible. That is our authority in all matters pertaining to our salvation. This, my friend, uh, is how God speaks. This is the final authority. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, let me remind you of this. The Holy Bible is totally unique. It is God's infallible source of great spiritual truth, infallible source of truth. It is written to save my soul and get me home uh, to glory. And you won't get home to glory unless you understand uh, the word of God. Now, John chapter 20 and verse 31 says this. John chapter 20 and uh, verse 31 but these are written that you may believe that Jesus Christ, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The reason God gave us the Holy Scriptures was so that we would believe in Jesus Christ. And thus, when we have faith in his holy name, we will be saved. So the Bible was written to lead us to Christ. Listen, because many people don't understand what I'm going to say now. The Bible was not written to make me an astronomer. I love astronomy. It wasn't written to make me an astronomer. It was not written to make me a surgeon. If I want my... This side is me. If I want my gallbladder, if I want my appendix or my gallbladder out, I do not go to a theologian. <laughs> I go to a doctor. You see that? The Bible was not written to make me a paleontologist. They are the people who mess around with old bones. It was not written to make me 
a zoologist. If I want to know how many teeth a horse has, I look in the mouth of the horse. I don't go to the Bible and say, now, Holy Bible, how many teeth has a horse got? It's not written to make me a zoologist, not written to make me an archaeologist, and I'm tremendously interested in archaeology. It may touch on those things, but the focus is God, truth, and salvation. You get this? And if people understood this, they wouldn't get so mixed up on some things. The Holy Bible is not written to make me worldly wise. It is written to save my soul, transform my life, and prepare me for eternity. Some people read the Bible for argumentation. Haven't you met them? They like to bash you over the head with the Bible. The Bible was not written for argumentation. It was meant to lead me to repent of my sins. It's a lot easier to argue over something in the Bible than to come to Christ and repent. The Bible is not a book about science because science changes from year to year. When people say, it's a book about science, I say, which science? Today or next year? Because the science next year will be different to the science today. It is God's special revelation about Christ and his gospel. And look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. That's why you've got to read the Bible. Don't be lazy. This country is full of lazy churchgoers. They're lazy. They don't read the scriptures. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, cuts, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrows and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God is powerful. When did you read it last? You read it every day? You say, well, look, I, I, I'm just such a, such a weak person. I've got so many problems. I have this spirit. The reason is because you don't let God's word get inside you. The word of God is powerful. The word of God is true. It's not fake news. It's not a lot of phony baloney. It is the truth. The word is creative. If you read the word, and let the word get inside you. You'll be recreated in the image of God. It is life-giving. It is convicting. When you read the word of God, you'll start to feel how great a sinner you are. People who get around proud as peacocks, the self-righteous people who often go to church, have never, never read the word of God as God gave it. The word of God is not written to make me feel righteous. It's convicting. It is comforting. It is renewing. It is disturbing. If you sit in church week after week, year after year, and you've never been disturbed by what you've heard, it's because you're dead. Hmm? Because it disturbs the conscience. When the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. And I can hate people. I can call them names. It's disturbing. It's encouraging. It is warning. It is saving. It will save your soul. And that's why I say to people, read your Bible every day. Read it every day. Oh, it's so hard. Don't be lazy. I have to. Do you think I always find it hard to read the Bible? No. My mind wants to run everywhere. What am I going to do in Manila? What am I going to do? No, I need to read the word and let the word convict my soul. And don't just read books about the word. This country is full of a billion books about the word. I wish we got rid of 99% of them and people read the word. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Now listen to this, because I'm starting to get warmed up. <laughs> in spite of persecution, indifference in the church, opposition, lying and cheating, politicking, 
Some people are all the time tied up with politicking. If you're tied up just with politics, you're on the road to perdition because politics cannot save your soul. Are you listening to me? There's some people sitting here today and you say, oh, my life is politics. I say, God have mercy on you because unless you're converted, you won't see the kingdom of God. And in spite of politicking, Calling people's name, people names. What an abomination that is. And every other sin, God has always had his preachers of the holy word. Let me tell you some of my favorites. John Wesley, a scholar from Oxford University, came over here to America to convert the Indians, but he said, who's going to convert me? He was a Church of England minister, Oxford scholar, sophisticated. He came back to London, went along to a little church, heard a layman read Martin Luther's preface to the book of Romans. And as this layman who'd never been to college was reading Luther, he got up and he said, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ. Have you ever had your heart strangely warmed? I want to tell you there's too much religion, man-made religion. Heart was strangely warmed by God. Then he was up at four o'clock in the morning preaching to the miners as they went to work. They told him, oh, Mr. Wesley, evangelism doesn't work anymore. People who say that are lazy. preaching at four o'clock in the morning to the miners. He saved England from the equivalent of a French revolution. Sometimes I would get him and throw him in the river, stone him with stones. As he is preaching, throw rotten eggs with him, at him. He was a man sent from God whose name was John. a mighty man of God. He traveled 360,000 miles on the back of a horse, sometimes walking through blizzards and the snow, pulling the horse. Why? Because of Christ. Where are his preachers today? George Whitfield, another man who came from Oxford, a close friend of John Wesley. I love these men. He came over to America, just a young guy preaching. On one occasion, there was a farmer. He saw this tremendous cloud of smoke. It wasn't smoke, it was dust. Thousands of people running, riding horses, ladies and gents in carriages. He said to his wife, get on the horse. And they galloped, came to this town. They were putting out a table. They helped a young boy get up on the table just a boy in his 20s. He preached the word, preached with so much power that the people were slain in the spirit. Thousands, thousands. That's because the word has got power. Then there was HMS Richards. Perhaps the greatest preacher we've ever had in our church. He came to Avondale College when I was a boy I heard him preach on the sermon, The Unsparing God. Only thing, basically, I remember from Avondale. God spared not the angels. If God didn't spare the antediluvians, if God didn't spare Sodom and Gomorrah, he's not going to spare you either. He's an unsparing God. Then he came to Romans 8, he who spared not his own son. The sin of the world was laid on him. That sermon changed my life. HMS Richards. He was a preacher of the word. Then when we were young people at college, Beverly and I went down with Pastor Heffron to Sydney, joined a crowd of well over 100,000, probably 150,000, 6,000 in the choir, and we heard a man look just like that, a young man, 
walking around saying, the Bible says, the Bible says. Preaching to cynical, tough Aussies. We don't believe in it. The Bible says. An altar call, thousands coming forward. Tell Billy Graham it doesn't work. It doesn't work for people who don't let it work, who don't have the Spirit of God. Then he told the story. He told the story that one red spot spoke about Napoleon after Waterloo. He pointed over to England and said, but for that one red spot, I would have conquered the whole world. And then he said, after Calvary, Satan and his generals got around and said, pointing to Calvary, but for that one red spot, I would have conquered the whole world. That sermon goes back a long time when I was just a boy. I've never forgotten it, the Bible says. Then early in our ministry, we went to a town in Australia by the name of Wagga Wagga. W-A-G-G-A, Wagga Wagga, great town. There was a preacher there who was preaching. We were there to help him but probably hindered him. His name was George Burnside. Great Bible preacher. One young man, a rebellious young man in his teens, after Pastor Burnside had preached for 60 minutes, he said to me, why does he have to stop? That's the power of God. Romans 1, 14 to 16, please. Romans 1, 14 to 16. I'm a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise, so as much as is in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are, who are in Rome also. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of the dunamis of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and then also for the Greek. It's the power of God. When God made the universe, he poured out tremendous power. Now the God who made the universe takes that power and pours it into the preaching of his word. What power. What power. God's mighty power is directed to save lost men and women through the word of God. 1 Peter 1, 23 to 25. 1 Peter 1. Having been born again, made new not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. All flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass, the grass withers and its flower falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached unto you. Goodness me. I make a promise to you, and listen very carefully. Let us sink down into your minds. Shun triviality and foolishness, stupidity. If you follow the truths of the Holy Bible, not the false teachings of men, but the words of God, you will be saved for all eternity in the kingdom of God. That is God's promise to you, but you've got to read it. Do not be lazy. Read the word. Start with the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Especially the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. Read it. So We come back to Luther. We started with Luther. We'll end with Luther. If you fill up your soul on the word, you'll be able to sing with Luther these words. What a hymn. A mighty fortress is our God. Our bulwark never failing, our helper here amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Dost ask who that may be, Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord, surveyeth his name from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. And though the world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. 
one little word shall fell him. That word, that word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. That was the Dark Ages church. No thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go this mortal life also. The body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Now, that's what changed the world. That's what gave us the Reformation. That's what raised up an enlightened people. It is that word received into the heart on a daily basis that will change and save your soul because Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And all the people said, Amen. amen and amen. There's only one thing that really counts in this lifetime, your relationship to Christ. And then if you have a right relationship with Christ, you want to tell people about Christ. That's why Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. By the grace of God, we're going to do that. We are doing that. That is why we're going back to Cuba, to this communist land, to preach Christ. We're accepting an invitation to go to the, the vast, huge city of Manila, the capital of the Philippines, been there before, but by the grace of God, we're going back. Please support us and please stand with us in the preaching of the everlasting gospel. You say, how do you do it? Who, who pays the bills? We do. Do you get any help, financial help? from the church. No, my friend, we don't. But we get a lot of help from God and from his children. Please support us in the preaching of the everlasting gospel. It's the most important work in all the world. Everything else is almost trivia. So would you please write to me? John Carter, Post Office Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Do your best for Jesus. Do your best for the gospel. And uh, in Australia, write to me at Terrigal. And we promise you this, every dime, every dollar is going to be used to win souls to our Lord Jesus Christ. Please write to me today. Thank you and God bless you. For a copy of today's program, please contact us at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Or in Australia, contact us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. This program is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you. We thank you for your continued support. May God richly bless you.